Um, I, I have interviewed her before, and I've been f fascinated by the UAE's um, efforts in space. And we have with us uh, Her Excellency Sarah Al Amiri. Uh, Sarah, please join us here. Your Excellency, join us. And 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 she is the uh, minister that has a huge portfolio. When you think about this, I wanted to bring basically the UAE space lady, and that that we we, we got you today, but also someone who's connecting public education and science together and weaving in you know, the elements of this ecosystem. So Your Excellency, it's very, very nice to have you with us at our Semaphore Forum today. I got to moderate the session uh, when the mission, Hope, uh, was went to, you know, blasted off and went to Mars. I interviewed a good number of folks from the UAE, but also within the NASA uh, world on that. Why don't you share with our audience how defining that moment was? Why did the UAE invest so substantially in a probe, because people ask ourselves, and I don't know, I mean, for you, it seems normal. For if you're not a, you know, know very much about the Emirates or anything, says, wow, they sent something to the moon. What's, what's all that about? So, or not to the moon. Well, you are sending something to the moon as well. So tell us about why the space program is so important to your development. Thank you very much, Stephen, for hosting me and a very good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us and taking from your time. Um, the Emirates took the step of venturing into the space sector with the primary purpose of driving our science and technology sector overall. Mm -hmm. uh, Mars was selected because it was really hard. Uh, it was a challenge that was several times tougher than any other program and project that we've handled. Uh, its underlying effect was the development and transformation of people. So a lot of our investments in these moonshot programs is mm -hmm. about development of skills, development of capabilities, development of know-how because that's how you create the spur. And what's interesting, um, Stephen, is, is based on what we've looked at in the space sector itself, research and development funding from 2018 till today has doubled, mm. more than doubled. The number of companies, so you've got a lot of impact above 100% year on year in terms of the growth. And that's the significance of having such monumental large core anchoring programs and projects within nations to be able to drive the science and tech se sector. And that takes me into the ripple effect that we've seen in other sectors. So the day that you spoke about um, in, in July of 2020 and then following into arrival to Mars in um, February of 2021 and then the first few months of science, mm -hmm. publications have significantly increased in that sector. Now to look at the ripple effect. UAE publications, UAE, UAE publications. authored publications, so in this, peer reviewed, in sciences. yeah, in the yes. sciences, peer reviewed, um, high high impact uh, journals, high impact conferences on the subject. The data itself is is unique and quite remarkable in terms of what it's it's doing for the science uh, community. If you take that from the macro lens perspective, and I take a step back with regards to the ripple effect to the technology sector and where I sit within the Ministry of Industry and Technology. Mm you see an interesting mindset shift where before simple risks that are overhauling, for example, your technology on the shop floor for manufacturing was deemed by management in certain companies and large companies within, within mm. the Emirates as exorbitant in terms of price, very risky because it disrupts your production process mm. and it has a lot of unknowns. So prior to February 9th, 2021, that would have been something that would have been shelved. Post that, it's up the game with how much risk appetite we have. Hmm. And today we're working very closely with more than 250 companies in our, our core sectors in looking at how do you infuse technology across your industrial process. And what's very important is also um, the um, mechanism of adopting technology, but ensuring that sustainability is a key pillar. So from the get-go, we've taken on our net carbon zero by, t by 2050 um, as an onus into the indus industrial sector to ensure that you're transforming it into opportunities. Otherwise, mm -hmm. if it makes no economic sense, it's, companies are not going to adopt more sustainability measures. So we even brought that into the game, looking at technology as a solution to create more value out of sustainability practices. All of this, so I was handling technology portfolio prior to 2021 and mm. post, my life has become, and my team's life has become significantly easier mm. because of that increase in understanding on the risk appetite, the value of taking risk and the ripple effect and the impact has been phenomenal and it allows us to uh, be able to, again, take a step back and look at it. And perhaps the lesson learned here is 
where do you as nations on the macro sense utilize such um, anchor moonshot programs and projects and at what part of your growth journey as nations or economies should it be utilized? I mean, if, if, if I may, I mean, I like the way you frame this around risk appetite and looking at what you're doing and, you know, why this became such a national development objective. Um, one of my friendly critiques of the broad Middle East is that they don't handle risk well because risk sometimes entails failure, learning from failure, picking up, but the liability for anyone that fails, the consequences are so substantial that it's a very different environment. You know, say if you look at Silicon Valley or other places that have this, how are you getting over and how have you gotten beyond that cultural framing of risk and failure so that you don't shut down, that you look at failure as an opportunity as yes. opposed to um, uh, something that you can't you know, handle? So we've handled it in different mechanisms. So first is the laws. You need to ensure that the law does not penalize failure, especially for the private sector. Um, and it manages to handle uh, failure well as a growth opportunity. So that's the first aspect. The second is, is understanding and, and a general understanding within go government for us on what our risk appetite is per program. Because that allows you to know where you're able to provide room for failure because it's a growth opportunity. Right. And where you require it to be delivered on time and you create a different environment there. That's a subtle way of changing, um, uh, uh, of changing cultural norms on, is it on whether or not it's okay to be wrong. Right. Um, within organizations and the organizations that, 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 uh, that I am part of, um, it's always something that, that I speak to the teams uh, with regards to what do we want to be done right. So we put right. all the different safety measures to continuously measure risk, mm -hmm. continuously offset it, continuously <laughs> mitigate it, and quickly react to failures. It, it's how fast you jump back that makes it that makes it what it is in terms of a success, mm. uh, rather than dwelling on it. The negative culture of, okay, let's dissect why we failed um, uh, is, is the one that's going to eventually die out by these practices. Um, and it's something that we have very interestingly in space sector, in the space sector, especially when you're, when you're operating with um, exploration. And it's been really interesting to bring them into other sectors. And it's just that simple understanding of how fast we react to failure. So how fast you jump back and move forward, then, bec then becomes the whole notion of failure being something that's wrong, obsolete. So another question, I know it's going to seem a little bit out of left field, but I was um, in the 1990s, worked in the Senate for Senator Jeff Bingaman of New Mexico. The biggest investment into the state of New Mexico was Intel's fab plant that went into Rio Rancho, New Mexico. There was good things about the story, bad things about the story. But one of the challenges for them was workforce. I mean, they became the biggest employer of anybody that did tech. Now, one of the interesting things is New Mexico was simultaneously one of the poorest states in the United States, but it had the most PhDs per capita uh, in, in the country because of national weapons laboratories that were there. And what was really interesting about this is that essentially from all over the state, anyone with any tech background got sucked up into it because, you know, the wages that were there, but there was just not enough education infrastructure to produce this. So the huge new investment in... Uh, tech and coding and fab plants and semiconductors and all of this came in. My sense is, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, is that your space mission has created the same challenge for the UAE, that anyone with any background in this sort of engineering or work or planning is being brought into this program stuff, and you have a deficit, you don't have enough people. And so how does the system invest to begin creating that, that pipeline of talent that you need. And I know that that's part of what you were trying to do, but how's that going? And tell us how you achieve it. So first off, am I right? Um, yes. And the, the demographic of the UAE would be quite different right. uh, than any other nation, considering that we are a nation of over 200 nationalities um, and uh, a nation w which is, which attracts talent from around the world. Uh, depending mm. on the programs that we have. So we do this twofold. Mm. Uh, in terms of talent, you need to make sure that you upskill them as fast as possible to be able to get them into uh, your programs to create the necessary impact and, and momentum. And by the way, the, uh, the challenge of, 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 of uh, that this has created is not only on the space sector. Right. On t technology yeah. background, people of technology background are now in high demand across 
several sectors because right. of the large drive that we have on various programs. So one is is in in a sort of know-how, experience building crash course um, on design and development in various tech fields uh, to be able to give into either fresh graduates and also starting to bring in vocational education, starting to bring in mm. um, other forms of education that Francine even spoke right. about earlier yeah. uh, to be able to create that necessary bridge. And then the second is also continuing the attraction. So more partnerships globally on science and tech uh, with UAE-based uh, industrial players or UAE-based uh, research centers together mm. with international ones. And that allows you to then capitalize on global uh, talent uh, and work together on areas of mutual benefit. The second one is also our current programs also actively recruit globally. Mm. Um, and our residency programs have been revamped over the course of the last two years uh, to allow for a better uh, and more impactful long-term stay within, within the Emirates. So all of these different factors have come to play has not only expedited those that are living in the Emirates today to enter into the space sector, but has also allowed people from different backgrounds that would want to utilize the UAE as their experimentation to deployment mm -hmm. bed for technology to come in and do that. What's your story? Like, how did you get into this? Um, a series of random events. Mm -hmm. What were they? Working, starting to work as a software engineer in the space sector in its infancy. When I mean, did you start and say, I want to be a software engineer? And I, I did. Yeah, really? But I never thought that I'd be in the space sector. Huh. So I'm a space engineer, I'm a uh, computer engineer by training, uh, specialized in software engineering. Uh, started my and did you come through the UAE public education system? Uh, no, private education. Oh, you did private education in yeah. the UAE? In the UAE. And so they had, and you know, and so as you did this and you came in, was the program robust? Were there lots of women in it? So um, I think it was the first, uh, the team was less than three years old when I came in. Right. I was the first uh, woman hired into it. Huh. Uh, but as we grew, as you know, our stats on the um, on the Mars mission is over 34% right. women, which mm -hmm. is considered high in the sector. Um, women are taking more and more roles. We've reached gender parity in graduates of STEM. Uh, and due to the high demand by default, the pipeline is no longer going to be leaky because you need access to talent regardless. Um, so it, it's, it's been an interesting transformative journey. And it's really interesting to see the perception and perspectives of both girls and boys today in schools mm. on what they want to be. Where I would have never thought to mention the things that they did. So talking mm. about working in space, working in tech. Um, becoming artists, actively um, driving art in the, in, in the international uh, space. It's not only about um, the space sector, but it's also about so many different sectors, including the creative sector. So it's really interesting, this, tra this, this transformation that our children today are going through um, and the massive opportunities that they, that they have access to. And by opportunities, it's, it's, it starts in your pre-perception and what the pre-perception of what society accepts. And that has vastly expanded. And that's usually one of the key triggers and drivers of what's going to create more access to talent. So are there more and more Emirati parents who are saying, hmm, I want my daughter to become a software engineer? That's, that's happening. Any, anything. Yeah. I, I, today, I don't, hear, um, I don't hear a lot of parents um, telling, telling their children that they can't be this because it doesn't exist or it's something that is... Um, so far out that it's right. not something that they can do here. Um, and that's created a very interesting uh, mechanism for growth where you're able to create the right, um, uh, the right um, ground to enable people to excel in the areas that they would like to excel in. Right. And then creating the opportunities as you move forward becomes very important. Creating a shared value system for growth also becomes very important. These are all things that we want to infuse into education and then skills. So it no longer becomes about uh, what type of knowledge you have and how you use that knowledge. It becomes more about what type of knowledge you have, what skills you have to be able to process that knowledge, and what value system you have to be able to grow uh, and drive change and transformation in the world around you. And the global context is also very important. So um, growing up, uh, I went to school from people from every single background that you can think of, every single religion you can think of. Right. Uh, everything, 
different types of belief systems, what they accept, uh, what are norms, and so on. That is remarkably amazing in mm. understanding that our differences is what drives us forward. And it's our differences that are going to create the change. And mm. I think starkly, Stephen, from the world that we see around us that's polarized whatever way you want, there's mm -hmm. polarized, um, you're either with us or against a situation. Um, this is the reverse. Being able to grow up in an environment uh, that allows you to see what differences are and in the innocent eyes of the child, accept that those are differences and we do live differently, uh, to become then the power by which you drive growth. So, you know, there's this company, and I may get it wrong, folks, called Al Asda. It's a section of BCW, mm -hmm. um, Burst and Cone Wolf, that does a big, huge annual survey of youth, both men and women interviews, and I read it every year. And um, the UAE, uh, not surprisingly, comes out the place where young people most want to live. They want to grow there. I mean, so this is across the Middle East. And and yet you see the struggle with the question of, I would, I would just put it in short form, modernity. Rationally, they want it, they don't know how to get there. What's your advice and counsel to other governments that may not have as enlightened a view as you do on entertaining very different multiple you know, frameworks, not having orthodoxies that they impose on people, but kind of opening that up. Does it's that very, make sense? It's a very difficult question to answer. Yeah. I'm not of the school of thought of giving advice to um, governments or nations yeah. or um, entities because, there, because of the deep understanding that there's a lot of nuances that we don't understand mm. uh, within any nation. Uh, but to take the ethos of what the, the, the government of the Emirates does is, uh, one, the long haul is what's important. Uh, creating opportunities, um, again, for your economy, for your people. And then third, investment in people. And it's these three elements that drives transformation forward. Mm -hmm. And with that, it's always an da even daily decision for us. So in the long haul, how is this going to impact if there is a skirmish or, or some mm -hmm. form of polarization as we see today. Is it going to remain? In most cases, the answer is no. Mm. We, we, we will all survive as nations and peoples around the world to be able to grow. Um, and it's, it's that general, it's difficult to put a word to it, but I'll, I'll call it the value system of governance. This general value system of governance and it's the general value system of, of being um, mm. and coexisting is what drives uh, um, transformation forward. Mm -hmm. And it's Stephen, it's very difficult to nuance what it is, uh, and it's very difficult. But to I think it is very important for UAE in terms of what it's achieving. It's sort of a show and tell it, opportunity, yeah. right? And it's difficult to say this is going to work anywhere else in the world, right? Right. As, as I said, there's a there's a lot of hidden elements that that exists within the fabric of any society that is very hard to codify and very hard to explain. Uh, but what I, what upon reflection, what 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 I work with is just a set of values that I work with my teams, that I work yeah. in my international relationships. Uh, that are working great, gr growing um, opportunities. Right. And you need to think of the global perspective of what you're doing and the impact of right. it. And at the same time, understanding where the opportunities are and understanding at the end of the day that every single practice that you go into, regardless of what it is, is a human-driven endeavor. Right. Be it in space, definitely in education. Um, and, and for us, even in industry and, and technology. And if you go down to the people element in every single sector, it no longer becomes... Uh, cut and dry um, uh, forms of uh, of making decisions and black mm. and white forms of making decisions and allows empathy to come in, it allows uh, understanding to come in, it allows us to also look at the big picture and, and hard numbers at the same time. Now, I may have this wrong, and I apologize if I do, but but my understanding of your story on the government is that you have science and that you chair the space agency, and along the way... They said, oh, you know, you seem to be doing so well with those. Why don't we, you know, keep you up more nights and gave you public education and you became minister of public education as well. And I'm really interested in how the public education sector saw that. What I mean, when I think about the United States, which is so different, I mean, you, education is controlled more locally in the U.S. Yes. Than, than at the, the federal level of looking at how you connect public education to science, to big national goals, which so, sounds so rational, but I know nothing is ever easy. So did was there resistance? What were the easy parts? What were the tough parts? What are the lessons you learned that might be interested in how you connect 
young people and their education and choices and opportunities and, and help them see that. But sometimes, you know, I've, I've been to, you know, schools throughout the Middle East and it's, it's hard. Not everybody's on board with the ambitions of Sarah Al, you know, Masiri. So, you know, I'm, I'm just sort of interested in how that gets dealt with. So I'm, I'm seven months into that job of uh, public education. Funnily enough, I found out right. on my way to Davos last May. So seven months you found on the way to Davos? On the way to Davos. Uh, uh, in Were you May. ticked off by the call? Or you said, oh, yes, that sounds I great. I was in the plane. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, uh, it's been an interesting journey so far. The people that are working in the education sector in the Emirates are amazing. Uh, truly mm -hmm. remarkable women and men uh, who put their hearts and souls into, right. into growing the education sector. Um, the lens, interestingly, that I come in is uh, is not so. People are usually worried initially uh. of, oh, are are we going full on science? Uh -huh. And and I always mention that no, 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 the two portfolios are disconnected. <laughs> so this is not going full on science. This is about realizing opportunity and skills um, for everyone, um, and working very from the ground up. Uh, teachers know best hmm. uh, on what needs to be transformed in education. Uh, students, like I mentioned to you, have an interesting, they're like sponges today. They're so interested in so many different fields that it comes to a point where they have so much knowledge at their, at their, at their finger trip, tip, where are you going to guide that? And then uh, lastly, what we're working on today is ensuring that the, the school systems is up to part what our expectations and requirements right. are as a nation. <laughs> Uh, that we continue to drive a, a value-based and a skill-based system because we even heard earlier from um, from Francine, a lot of what you learn, you, your ability to learn and relearn and continue that process becomes more important than anything else at this point. Um, and, it's, and, and that then transforms the way you think about it. The curriculum and the knowledge that you gain in the classroom teaches you how to use it. That's what's important teaches you the necessary skills to be able to process more knowledge. That's what's important. It allows you to be a person in this interesting, globally dynamic transformation and be globally competitive. That's what's important. And the knowledge then becomes the vessel and the tool rather than becoming the primary focus of outcome. And it's that that we're now transforming everything around it. So how should our assessments be? What forms of pedagogy do you need to, do you need to have in place? How do you work with your teachers to continue upskilling them to be able to deliver right. this mode of education? Uh, and that's what's been really interesting um, throughout this seven-month journey now. Let me get a couple of quick more questions in, and then I'll, and I'll go to the audience. But um, I'm interested. I know this is, again, a little odd question, but I'm always interested in someone in like your role, how comfortable, you, you know, whether the question is to educate everyone broadly with, and in sort of a homogenized way, and, and, but are you also trying to produce a few geniuses? And, and I'm really interested in genius because genius often comes in the forms that are people who are socially kind of jerks. They don't necessarily homogenize or align well. They're disruptive thinkers. They're not aligned with social. And I see a lot of these people, you know, I used to help run a think tank and I, my job was to create a comfortable home for people who were socially maladjusted, but they were brilliant uh, in creating things. And it's very hard to do as opposed to think tanks that homogenize behavior, crush out, you know, kind of independent disruptive thinking. And I see this all the time. There's a tension in almost every institution. So how do you handle the genius problem? So I go back to a remark I made earlier to one of your questions, which is how do you focus on development? If you focus on the individual, you realize that there's no such thing as a homogenized yeah. uh, education system. And when you look at, at schools for the Emirates, more than 530 schools scattered across Emirates from, and, and different cities with, uh, for you, it's one culture, but we have an amazing nuances of subcultures that exist within mm. the country. Um, and being able to say that every single school in every single district in every single city and town will operate the same way. That makes absolutely right. no sense whatsoever. Uh, so if you're focusing on what I spoke about earlier, values right. and skills development, um, you're then catering for a minimum set of knowledge requirements or um, I'll call it an average set of, mini of, right. of requirements in terms of knowledge and core skills and core uh, values, um, and then working, allowing for those individualized growth for the system not to penalize mm. them. Because that, that's what you're talking about. There are those right. geniuses that the system penalizes them. Right, they do. Yes. 
So you need to create a system that doesn't penalize, and it's not easy to do. Mm. It's, it's not something that we are going to wave some form of a magic wand and it's happening overnight. Mm. It's something that's going to take at least a decade to transform. And last question, and, and you may just get, because I am interested in the space programs that you, you have there. So I was involved with, you know, commenting on the HOPE uh, mission, the HOPE probe that went to Mars. My understanding is you've got a mission to the moon, which I guess is very easy now, uh, not a big deal. Um, but but um, and you also have another mission that involves Venus and I think either a comet or, you know, so just give us a quick update on what the next big programs are in the UAE space program. I'll mention the why, which is the objective that I'm holding the, right. the, the team at the space agency accountable for. The uh, why is building a private space sector for the Emirates. Okay. Uh, and building international collaboration. Now the how, because uh -huh. you need to build heritage, you need to build capabilities, you need to be able to expand the, the remit of what is apl applicable. The how then becomes a uh, continuation of science on your Mars mission. It becomes our next mission that's launching in 2028, which has right. a flyby by Venus, goes further than where Mars is, gets to the asteroid belt where it's really cold and uh, and explores seven asteroids over the course of five years. Mm. So it's even... If if Mars was hard, this is just a a I don't know. It's a I don't think I have a word to explain how difficult really it is. really hard yeah. really really hard in comparison. <laughs> um, still doesn't sum it up, but yeah. it's a, it's an amazing challenge. Um, and then you have our constellation of SAR satellites, our focus on data analytics, and all of that is creating more and more companies in the country who are working actively in providing contracts that are right. part of these programs even to individuals that still haven't established their businesses to be able right. to just get them through that hump of, of, of getting um, uh, their businesses started. So it, it's, it's going to be an interesting few years to be able to drive that forward, yeah. uh, especially with the amount of risk that we have to offtake from the private sector to be able to do So that. And one, one last question, then, and then some quick questions here. I know that the U.S. is very involved. You work with NASA, and I know that you've got – uh, women in the NASA astronaut program. I interviewed one of them around the time that I talked to you with the Hill. It was fascinating. Who other than the U.S. is cool to work with um, internationally in the space program? Who's who's got it together that you think deserves a shout out? I think everyone in the space sector. Oh come is cool. on! Oh, it's you know? true. Yeah. <laughs> um, I China? started working with Korea. Korea. Um, that has been great. Um, we've launched. Um, I, don't, I think we've worked with a lot of people at, at any given time. So it's just been an interesting collaborative environment. How frustrating are Americans to work with? <laughs> Not frustrating. Okay. Yeah. You have another word? No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me take a few questions from the audience. John Arendelle, let me get you a mic, John, because we're on, we're recording this. So uh, Mitch will hand you the mic. And real quick, John. Uh, John Arendelle from Washington, D.C., I'm really interested in what you were saying earlier about uh, differences and educational differences and all the great work that uh, the GCC countries are doing um, in terms of neurodiversity. Um, I, last month, we, me and a group put together a neurodiversity forum with the mayor um, of New York, and um, 1.6 billion people have okay. dyslexia and stuff. What are you doing in, in, in there to, to promote um, education? people with educational differences, so they can become engineers. Um, so we're looking at inclusive education. That's what we call it. Uh, we do have a program of inclusive education that we're iteratively um, uh, enhancing. We have a particular focus. So um, when, I, when I was appointed on public education, we had a bit of a transformation for our education journey where an, a new entity was established just to focus on children from birth, mm -hmm. zero, all the way till fourth grade, about 10 years old. Um, and inclusive education, the earlier you detect it, the earlier you have tools and mechanisms and individuals within schools to detect it, uh, the easier it's going to become for, for every child that has any form of learning challenge. Uh, and that's the approach that we're taking today. So we do have inclusive education, but we want to go from the very start, ensure that our school system has the right people um, in it to detect it earlier and provide the necessary support um, and, and growth plans forward. And it's it, with that early uh, detection that we're able to uh, push that forward. So that's a drive that we're, we're undergoing today. Any other questions, comments? I'm going to ask just real, real quickly, and then, and then we'll move to Alex Soros, who's just joined us. Um, I'm interested in, and again, show and tell, and I know that you're reticent about telling other governments you know, how to operate being open. 
But I think that one of the reasons why I wanted to have Fran Katsudis in you this morning is because of the outstanding examples you represent uh, in fields where there just are not a lot of women leaders doing the kind of thing you're doing. It's very special to see. Is there a role that government should be out there more and say we need gender parity, as you were talking about in these things? Should we be looking at uh, and, and seeing governments tell Afghanistan, you know what, you're leaving so much talent on the table um, and, 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 and create, you know, I'm all, all in favor, particularly with brilliant women in Afghanistan, of creating an underground railroad and getting them out of there and, you know, you know, see what happens to your society. But I'm just interested in whether we're too passive on the question of women and talent particularly in technology, Again, but I, other areas. Yeah, I can speak to our, uh, yeah. uh, the case that has worked in the Emirates to get to where we are today. Uh, first, you need to understand what, where the cultural norms are and what needs to be transformed. But some of them are awful, right? So yeah, they are, to, yeah. We, we yeah. all need to yeah. know that we, all of us, regardless yeah. of where you come from, have awful cultural, yeah. Yeah. cultural yeah. Okay. No, norms yeah. that evolution, evolution of society usually grows out of. That's normal, right? Mm. That's how, that's how societies grow and adapt and, and continue to create impact and continue to produce amazing things uh, is by by growing out mm -hmm. from norms that have been holding us back. Uh, so, and that's also the same when, when you're talking about uh, when you're talking about uh, being more inclusive of women um, in tech. Ensure knowing that we're all biased mm -hmm. is what I say. Francine spoke about data. That's that's one mechanism of us know, holding ourselves accountable. We're all biased here in some shape or form. With that realization is an understanding of how do you counteract that bias. These are all soft mechanisms to do that. The government mm -hmm. comes in at the very end. With these change, you change in people the need and the drive to create this transformation. When you're aware, none of us want to be biased. When you're aware of, of any inherent biases that you have, you work on yourself to be able mm -hmm. to ensure, and your organizations to be able to ensure that you create the necessary impact and growth forward. So it's the first step. What the, that creates is growing out of, of the norms, cultural norms. Then comes in the role of the government once you've got in 50 to 60 to 70 people across into understanding why this is important. Enforcing something by law doesn't allow people to realize why it's important. We need to know why something's important to be actively behind it. Right. Then comes in the role of government. So we've recently had it. We've... I went into the workforce being paid exactly the same as, as somebody who was hired as a, uh, as a male counterpart who was hired as an engineer. That law didn't exist. Mm. Um, the law came into effect a few years ago where uh, just to bridge the final gap, um, be able to ensure that women have equal pay for equal work. Mm. And that's when the role of the government comes. It's role modeling. Mm. It's creating effective policies. It's creating effective understanding and then when you have the final mile that you need to get people across is when you start bringing in adamant, this is how we're doing it. This mm. is what's acceptable. Well, Minister Sarah Al-Amiri, I always love our conversations. They're always terrific. Thank you so much for sharing your story, joining us. Really appreciate it. Big round of applause. Thank you, Sarah. Great to see you. Thank you.